Welcome to module four. Um, in this module, we're going to, going to continue our discussion of stereochemistry to start before moving into the next kind of round of topics. Um, stereochemistry continues to be just a major central theme of uh, understanding organic chemistry, um, anywhere from developing new materials to um, developing new molecules that could be used as therapeutics. So the, a more in-depth look, uh, look into this topic is, is really required. Um, so we're going to sort of pick up with where we left off um, talking about stereochemistry. And again, everything's going to be kind of a little bit deeper and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I think it's a little bit more interesting. It does get to be a little bit more um, involved, but um, again, I guess that's sort of the nature of the beast. So what I wanna start with is um, actually, if you recall, let's, let's, let's go back to this. So recall that um, all chiral, really objects in general, but we'll focus on molecules, have one enantiomer, one enantiomer. And the reason why is because that, that um, an enantiomer is a mirror image stereoisomer And you just can't have more than one mirror image of yourself, right? Um, based on how you're oriented, you just look at, look at yourself in the mirror and that's it. That's the mirror image, whether you're a person or a molecule, you only have one mirror image. Now, what's unique about chiral molecules is they're different from their mirror image, whereas most things like basketballs, soccer balls, that sort of thing, they're the same as their mirror image. Um, chiral molecules are not, achiral molecules are. So just recall that, uh, achiral molecules are identical to their mirror image. Okay, so achiral molecules are identical to their mirror image. That is to say, um, another way that we can kind of scientifically think about what it means to be the same or identical to something else is we would say that it's superimposable. Superimposable on its mirror image, it's identical to its mirror image. Okay, so chiral molecules aren't identical to the mirror image, but you can only have one mirror image, so you can only have one enantiomer. Everything else is diastereomers, um, so we can recall that, uh, also recall that um, molecules can have zero to, I'm not gonna say infinity, zero through big numbers of diastereomers. We had talked about an equation where if you have a stereo center, um, for, or I guess for every stereo center that you have, if you wanna figure out the total number of permutations of wedges and dashes, you would take um, that you would take, you would solve for the equation two to the n, where n is the number of stereo centers. And so if you have like eight stereo centers, that number gets to be really big. So you can get to be some really big numbers if you have molecules with multiple stereo centers, just based on, you know, laws of permutational mathematics, that sort of thing. But um, I, I wouldn't say an infinite, but this is a really interesting statement that I've just put up here. Um, molecules can have zero to big numbers of diastereomers. Notice that I said, I said molecules. I didn't write chiral molecules, whereas before I said chiral molecules have one enantiomer. Molecules just in general can have zero to big numbers of stereoisomers. That implies that achiral molecules, achiral molecules always have zero enantiomers. This is something that we knew because enantiomers are mirror images. And if you're the same as your mirror image, then you're an anti you don't have an enantiomer. It's just yourself. It's just the molecules itself in the mirror. So um, achiral molecules, things that aren't chiral, have zero enantiomers, but could still have diastereomers. That's pretty weird, and it's an artifact of symmetry. And we'll look at this in more detail in this lecture. 
These are called mesomolecules. Mesomolecules are achiral molecules with stereocenters, with stereocenters and diastereomers. I can't think of an example where a mesomolecule doesn't have a diastereomer. I don't think so. But it's an achiral molecule that has with stereocenters, so like carbons with four different things attached to it, and diastereomers, but it has no enantiomers because if we say achiral, we're saying no enantiomers. I can't emphasize that enough. We're gonna look at some weird aspects of chirality in this module. And it's important to remember that for something to be chiral, fundamentally, it's not four different things attached to carbon. Fundamentally, it is about its ability to be identical or not to its mirror image, okay? That's what we have to hold on to. We have this shortcut, which for the most part works really well, where if we have a carbon atom with four different things attached to it, that typically renders the molecule chiral. But fundamentally, most rigorously, most precisely, never leads you astray, is looking at the mirror image and seeing if the two molecules are, super, are superimposable or identical to each other. If they are superimposable, I don't care how many different things are attached to a carbon atom, that molecule is achiral. Let's look at an example of this. So let's say we take this molecule. I'm gonna go ahead and just indicate to you that this molecule is meso. Now that, that definition of meso means the molecule is achiral and it has stereocenters. Let's start with the latter point, the stereocenters. If we look at this molecule, it does indeed have, we could put two stars next to those carbons, it does indeed have stereocenters. Those carbon atoms with the wedges have four different things attached to it, right? We have a methyl group. I'm just going to highlight these and then erase it. So methyl group, rest of a chain, bromine atom, and then a hydrogen going back. Okay, there are four different things attached. That is indeed a stereocenter. Maybe I'll leave that up. That seems helpful. Okay, what I'm going to do is draw a mirror plane. And with the mirror plane, I'm going to draw the mirror image of this molecule as a reflection. So I'm taking the reflection approach to drawing an enantiomer. So an enantiomer is the mirror image of a chiral molecule. So the first thing that we're gonna bump into is this bromine atom here. All right, so that's the kind of the first thing that runs into the mirror. That's the first thing that we draw. Okay, then we go to the rest of the chain to a bromine atom. And if you want, I could go hydrogen here and I could label the, the, the sure. Okay, four different things attached two stereocenters present, the mirror image is drawn um, by just showing it's the, the reflection of the original molecule across the mirror plane. Now what you have to notice, what you have to really recognize, and hopefully it's not too much of a mental struggle, is these two structures are the same. Identical, identical, ugh, they're the same. <laughs> Spelling goes away when the keyboard's not in front of me. Okay, anyway, so those two structures are the same. We could take, I'm just gonna do this and I'm gonna put it back. I'm gonna put it back, don't worry. We could take this and just like superimpose it and you see how the wedges line up perfectly, okay? Yes, I know that, um, you know, I labeled one side one and one side the other, but they are in fact superimposable. They are in fact the same. Now, what if you wanted to take a different approach to drawing the enantiomer? What if you wanted to draw the, um, the scenario where we flip all of the wedges to dashes and then all of dashes to wedges, we would just go like this. Okay, if we wanna test for superimposability in this case, what we would have to do is try to rotate the molecule around so that we get at least some Overlap. Remember, if we can find some way to rotate the molecule so that we have kind of perfect overlap at every edge, nook and cranny on the molecule, then we say they're superimposable. And to do that, we would just spin this around horizontally, 180 degree spin. And that would give you the structure that we've shown here, 
right now after a 180 degree spin that structure where we flipped all of the wedges to dashes is identical to the mirror image i mean it should be right whenever we flip all the wedges to the dashes i'm saying that we're we're getting to the enantiomer we're getting to the mirror image in that case so here these are the same what we say then is that if they're the same that is the original molecule is the same as its mirror image it is not chiral and i'm just writing that to emphasize it i would much rather you said the term a chiral okay so a chiral these molecules are a chiral this molecule excuse me is a chiral because it's identical to its mirror image um, I've drawn three bond line structures on this page. They all depict the exact same molecule because we can rotate it around and make it superimposable. Okay, I think I beat that into the ground. But we have to recognize that this molecule does have stereocenters. This is weird, okay? The molecule has stereocenters. But it's a chiral. Why? Why is this the case? Why is it a chiral? Well, the answer is always chiral things are not superimposable on their mirror image, and a chiral things are superimposable on their, on their mirror image. But maybe you want a different way of thinking about this, which is actually really helpful, and that's the idea of um, planes of symmetry. So why? The answer is because the molecule has a plane of symmetry. Now, planes of symmetry, when they exist, what you can do is sort of draw a line or a plane down bisecting the molecule this way or this way or this way, whatever you want to do. And then whatever's on one side of the plane is going to be the same as what's on the other side of the plane. So let's draw an example of that by just going back to our molecule. Okay, so if I truly have a plane of symmetry, I should be able to bisect the molecule in some way and get to something where the thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right. Okay, and that's indeed what we see. The thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right. Something that might trip some people up, ignore this. If this, if this makes sense to you, ignore what I'm about to say. But something that trips people up is they might be like, well, the BR is read from left to right on one side and then Shouldn't it be from right to left on the other side? Remember, a BR is just a notation for some big atomic sphere with a bunch of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The way the molecule is actually depicted, those bromine atoms look the same on the left and the right. Okay, and that's really helpful to kind of keep in mind as you're um, considering more complicated scenarios where we have planes of symmetry. So if there is a plane of symmetry, the molecule is automatically achiral. You cannot have a molecule that's chiral and has a plane of symmetry, okay? So let's say that a different way. Molecules, and this is called bilateral or cut in half symmetry. Molecules with bilateral symmetry are not chiral. And so bilateral just means a cut in half symmetry. I mean, I know that's a really, for those that have a deeper understanding of symmetry elements, that's a, a pretty, um, pretty lazy description, but that's okay. Bilateral plane of symmetry shown up above. So molecules with bilateral symmetry are not chiral. Okay, and this applies to really any molecule, whether or not it has stereocenters. That is to say, that now we can take this definition and add another aspect of it. Molecules with stereocenters and bilateral symmetry are meso. Molecules with stereocenters and bilateral symmetry are meso. So again, meso is, is actually starting to emerge is just something that happens to molecules that have planes of symmetry. So if you've got 
opportunities for symmetry, like where you've got a bromine on the left side and a right side, or another example is if you've got something like, if you've got something like this, okay, that too has bilateral symmetry. It's bilateral symmetry. It has stereocenters, carbons with four different things attached to it, bilateral symmetry with stereocenters. And I would call that meso. And I would remind myself that it's a chiral. I think it's really helpful when you identify a molecule to be meso is to write in parentheses next to it a chiral. It just reminds you that these molecules just aren't chiral. They don't rotate plane polarized light. They're not superimposable on their mirror image. Everything we know about chiral molecules, for the most part, doesn't apply to these things. Now, the weird thing about them is that since they have stereocenters, we could draw diastereomers of them. So diastereomers of the meso compound. Well, recall that a diastereomer is where we, where we flip some stereocenters, but not all stereocenters. So let's say we keep the right one the same and flip the left one, okay? And let's say then we draw another one where we have the opposite combination of wedges and dashes. So these two are enantiomers of each other. And diastereomers of the meso compound. Huh. Okay. Maybe the diastereomers is settling in okay. We have this original meso molecule. Okay, just to, to direct your eyes there. We have that meso molecule. And then we drew two, stereo, two diastereomers of it just by flipping wedges and dashes. Hopefully that's okay because that was a concept from module three where we said that diastereomers flip some of their wedges and dashes, but not all of them. But then why are the two purple compounds enantiomers of each other? Well, recall that with enantiomers, we flip all of the stereocenters, not just some, not just one, unless there's only one, but here there's two. So we have to flip both of them. The wedge goes to a dash, the dash goes to a wedge as we interconvert between these two structures. That makes them enantiomers. Well, not always, right? When we looked at this structure up here and compared it to this structure, I said I could do a 180 degree rotation and that made that into a molecule that could be superimposed on itself. So those molecules were the same. That is to say this molecule that we labeled meso doesn't have enantiomers. That's just another way of saying the molecule is a chiral. So what I'm getting at is why are the purple compounds enantiomers? I think I just answered that, right? I said that if you flip all of the wedges to dashes, you get to enantiomers. Maybe a better question is why are they chiral? Achiral molecules have zero enantiomers always and forever because the mirror image is the same as the original structure. But here we took the diastereomers of a meso molecule and we got something that is chiral. So we started achiral and we got to diastereomers that were chiral. That is, that's a really important point. Often, the diastereomers of a meso molecule are chiral. It's really hard to come up with examples where they're not. So we've got this one odd duck and then the others are chiral and therefore they have enantiomers. And so this is getting really philosophical, isn't it? It's like, man, sometimes they have enantiomers and sometimes they don't. Well, keep, keep the foundation strong. To understand chirality, it's all about, is it the same as its mirror image? That's all I'm doing is showing you a really weird situation that happens when you introduce a bilateral plane of symmetry. 
you introduce a bilateral plane of symmetry, one of these things that you predicted to be chiral because of the four different things rule um, is now achiral. But everything else is the same. That is, you draw a bunch of diastereomers, they're all themselves chiral. Well, let's look at that in more detail. Why are, let's see, what did I do? I did dash wedge, okay. Why is this molecule chiral? Well, it doesn't have a plane of symmetry. Nope. It has no bilateral symmetry because the left side would have been a dash, the right side would have been a wedge in this case. That means that if we introduce a mirror plane, since we have stereocenters and since we lack a plane of symmetry, what we have to say then is that these molecules are, I'm just drawing the mirror image, these molecules are not superimposable. They're different from each other. Look, I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna take advantage of technology. I try to superimpose it, I can't, right? The wedges and the dashes don't overlap. Hmm. Well, another way of drawing this molecule, instead of drawing its mirror image, is to flip all the wedges to the dashes. But that's what I did. <laughs> if you look at the mirror image that I drew across the mirror plane, it actually, in this particular case, is the same as if you said, I'm gonna flip all of the wedges to the dashes. Okay, so what I'm getting at is no matter what you do to this molecule, you cannot get it to superimpose or be identical to its mirror image. And as a result, remember, it's not superimposable in its mirror image. It is chiral. So these are mirror plane, not superimposable. Not chiral. OK. Um, so what we do is we draw molecules with multiple stereo centers, and we just keep an eye out for opportunities to introduce planes of symmetry. OK? so. Draw multiple stereoisomers. And watch, oops, I misspelled watch, for planes of symmetry. OK. So I'm going to do an exercise. It's an exercise that looks like something that we did for module three. I'm going to say, hmm, let me think for a second. Let's take this molecule and that'll be A and then this molecule for B. And in these molecules, I want to draw all stereo isomers. Okay, we did that on exam three, right? We saw some molecules, we drew all the stereo isomers. I want to draw all stereo isomers, and then step two, I want to label each pair as diastereomers or enantiomers or and step three, label a meso stereoisomer. Okay. Last thing I want to do is I want to make sure I have no duplicate structures. No duplicates. All right, here we go. Let's look at A first. So with A, we have two stereoisomers. I'm going to go wedge. Wedge, wedge, dash, dash, wedge, and dash, dash. Okay. So with the fluorine atoms, my Fs were a little sloppy. Sorry about that. I have all the stereoisomers, right? So, whoop, holy cow, did I get ultra sloppy? That would have been points off. Okay, remember that when I, when I ask for evals. Okay, anyway, we have A, B, C, D. All right, so A versus B. Okay, we flipped some, but not all. So those are diastereomers. A versus C. Flip some, but not all. So those are diastereomers. A versus D. We flipped 
all, but not some, so those are enantiomers. And then for B, B, C, B versus D, and then C versus D, right? This is like how we solve this problem. B versus C, those are enantiomers. B versus D, those are diastereomers. C versus D, those are diastereomers. Okay, so I'm just doing what I did last time. Now what I need to do is, in step three, is um, ask the question, are any of these things meso? And what you want to do is look at the enantiomeric pairs. So I look at the enantiomeric pairs and I see that if we compare A versus D, What I'm really asking is, is there a way for these two molecules to be um, superimposable on each other? Well, no, because if I, if I try, okay, I've got good alignment of my fluorine atoms, right? I've got good alignment, but the, um, like in that two dimensional space, but the wedges and dashes don't overlap. Okay, let's rotate it. Well, if I rotate it, if I rotate it 180 degrees, then I've got, I've got wedge here, wedge here. No, no, I don't. I've got wedge on the other side. If I spin it around 180 degrees, I go like this. And yeah, there's no way, right? There's no way to get these things to superimpose on each other. So these are not superimposable. If they're not superimposable, they're chiral. And if they're chiral, they're definitely not meso because remember meso had the, all, the additional description of being a chiral. Okay, let's consider C versus D now. Okay, so, or B, excuse me, B versus C. So I went wedge dash. So in B versus C, well, if I take it as is, it doesn't look like it, but I just, Maybe I just need to roll this around a little bit. If I, hmm, let's see. If I spin this around this way, if I spin that around this way, then I get to something that looks like, whoops, excuse me. I get to something that looks like this. So I just spun the molecule around. I kind of tilted it this way. Okay, if I do that. Uh-oh. Those look super imposable on each other. I mean, I know it's not, an imp it's not a perfect drawing, but my dashes and my wedges align the same atoms. And so those are the same. It's superimposable on its mirror image. It's achiral, but we have stereocenters. So the molecule is meso, achiral with stereocenters, meso. Ooh, Willoughby, that took some work. Rotating that molecule around like that, I'm just beginning this. You said there was an easier way of doing this that involved a plane of symmetry. If you look at this molecule, it does not have a bilateral plane of symmetry. So what are we to do? Well, what we can do is take advantage of free rotation. Another thing that we could do is redraw the molecule where we spin this molecule here. And so to take advantage of 
free rotation over the CC middle bond. And I'm gonna rotate the molecule so that the fluorine spins around and is up. And that gives me, the fluorine on the right spins around and is up. And that gives me this molecule. So we have bilateral symmetry. with stereocenters. And what that means is we have a mesomolecule and we're achiral. Okay, so we did it. We found the mesomolecule and that'll be what we see on this exam is we'll see um, molecules where we have the same substituents on either side of the molecule. So we have to identify which of the stereoisomers is the mesostereoisomer and cross out any duplicate structures. So for example, going back to our depiction of this, we would say that this is one molecule, this is another molecule. Actually C is identical to D. C is identical to D, but then D is a third molecule. And B is the meso slash achiral molecule. And then we would say that of the two enantiomeric pairs, A versus D and B versus C, B versus C was actually the same. We actually have the same molecule because of symmetry. We, could, we were just able to find, rotate the molecule around to see that bilateral plane of symmetry. Okay, so I wanted to show this example and then I'll show it in contrast. The next example will be a bit easier, but when you've got this kind of, um, when you've got sort of a butane chain or an even chain, and the carbons in the, in the groups that allow for bilateral symmetry are separated by zero carbons or an even number of carbons. The way to see the bilateral plane of symmetry is to do a free rotation. Um, so there are a lot of examples where I could have this same butane chain in two identical groups on the second and third carbons, and it will have stereocenters, but it's the ones where they're facing opposite directions, actually I'm gonna highlight a different chain, facing opposite directions and pointing and wedge and dash is opposite and up and down is opposite. Those are actually the mesomolecules. It can be hard to see on these butane chain examples. So let's go to the other one. Let's see, what were the, the molecule was um, this. So I'll redraw it for B. This one should be a bit easier if you're following along with the lecture. So you can have for B, OH, 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 OH. OH, 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 OH. So now we have A, B, C, D. We could go A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, B versus C, B versus D, C versus D. So A versus D, those are enanti A versus B, excuse me, those are diastereomers of each other. A versus C, those are diastereomers of each other. A versus D, at this point, they appear to be enantiomers. So I'll write that and I'll revisit those. And then B versus C, those are enantiomers. I'll revisit that one. The rest are diastereomer pairs. Okay. Now what we see is that with A and B, we could rotate the carbon oxygen bond so that the H's are in opposite directions and we have bilateral symmetry here. So we could do that with either the wedges or the dashes. And that means that A and D are achiral with stereocenters, so they're our meso compound. So A versus D is actually the same. A is our meso compound. D is a different depiction of A. That's also our meso compound. And if you can rotate molecules around your head, that's excellent. People will pay you big monies take D and spin it around 180 degrees on its horizontal axis. 
and you'll get to something where the OHs start back and they rotate around forward. <laughs> that was terrible. They then are rotating towards you and they're wedges, but they're still just OHs. By symmetry, we see that that molecule is meso. Okay, I'm gonna leave the notes up as I close out the lecture. Um, so what we were looking at today is that when you have multiple stereocenters, you have the opportunity to form diastereomers. We looked at that last time. However, when the multiple stereocenters have kind of identical functional groups, in this case, we had rest of the chain, usually a methyl group, and then either an OH, a BR, or an F. And we've got identical groups attached to the stereocenters. We have the opportunity to introduce bilateral symmetry. Bilateral symmetry destroys the opportunity for the overall molecule to be chiral. However, it can still have diastereomers and it actually still has stereocenters. But all of the rules apply. If you're superimposable on your mirror image, you don't get the opportunities that chirality provides. It turns out that these mesomolecules, despite having stereocenters, do not rotate plane polarized light, I, um, interact identically with other chiral objects in the universe. They're just as chiral as a basketball. Um, and so that is to say they're just as not chiral as a basketball. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a uh, little bit of an awkward way to say that. Anyway, I know this can be kind of a trippy lecture, a little philosophical, but just remember, if you want to be chiral, you have to be superimposable on your mirror image. <laughs>